so I'm going to explain what this title means, but I'm, I'm going to start with trying to sort of set the stage for programming systems for exascale. Um, before I do that, uh, whenever I talk to an international audience, I put a map of the U.S. and show people where Utah is. Uh, it's on, in the West, and that actually, the picture on the left is actually more or less what you can see out my window, although it's not obvious. Um, and uh, we're fairly broad, fairly large department. Uh, I can't keep up with the numbers anymore, and we're always looking for more people to come join us. Uh, I have a bunch of collaborators on the work I'm presenting from all over, and so I just want to give acknowledgments to them. Okay, so, uh, so I'm going to start. What is an exascale supercomputer? Well, it's a machine capable of executing 10 to the 18 operations per second, or a quintillion operations, and we usually measure that in floating point operations. Uh, typical laptop, like the one uh, that I'm using to give this presentation, is at the gigascale. Um, so one way you could potentially build an exascale supercomputer is to put 50 million laptops together and interconnect them somehow. Um, unfortunately, that's not going to work very well. Uh, it's not going to be very efficient. So uh, this is an example of a supercomputer, uh, the most powerful supercomputer. Uh, it's currently in China. It's the Taihu Light, and it's at 93 petaflops, so it's still 11 times off of, exas uh, of uh, exascale. Okay, so um, getting to exascale is something that's very important in the U.S. and in probably in China as well. Um, and so this is a, a executive order from President Obama from last year, uh, creating a national strategic computing initiative. And this is having a lot of impact on the research programs in high performance computing in the US. So the very first, uh, it, it, so he has a list of, of uh, the, this executive order has a list of objectives and they're all surrounding the idea of everybody working together to work towards um, exascale. And the very first one is uh, accelerating uh, delivery of a capable exascale computing system that integrates hardware and software capability. So what I'm gonna focus on in this talk is the, um, is the software side of this. Um, and I'm gonna trust the vendors to come up with the hardware solutions. So, uh, so I, I, are there undergrads here, David? I have my, my laundry analogy for parallel computing. Yeah, keep going. We, we have a couple, so. Okay. And, and some, some of our staff behave like undergraduates, so. We'll okay. Ready. All right. So, so I'm going to use this laundry analogy. So sequential programming, this is a, you know, stackable washer dryer you would have in your apartment. You have four loads of dirty clothes. You have to set up a pipeline. You wash for an hour. You dry for an hour. It takes you five hours to do your laundry. So um, here's parallel programming. You go to a laundromat, and now you have replicated resources, and you can do your laundry faster. So you do it in two hours. Um, so suppose instead that we go to a supercomputing uh, laundry facility, and um, so now the the laundry the washer dryer aren't that much more powerful than what you would have at home. They're doing double O's or cycles a little faster. Um, and you can get your laundry uh, done in an hour and a half. Uh, even if you have 8 million loads, just need enough washers and dryers. So what are the programming challenges? Uh, the, uh, in a exascale supercomputer, the first one is just managing complexity. So you have to get it right. Um, Taihu Light has more than 10 million processors. Um, sec second is utilizing the hardware resources efficiently. Um, your code won't speed up if you don't use the resources. So this person is reading their book and they miss the fact that their laundry is done in the washer and they need to move it to the dryer. And so you have idle time. Another challenge is data movement cost. Uh, so uh, the compute time to compute is much lower than the time to access memory, which is much lower than communication. So these sheets have to get moved around the room. Okay, and then another uh, 
Another challenge is what we call performance portability, and you should remember this one because it's for sure going to come back. Uh, the same program has to perform well on diverse supercomputing platforms. And you look at the three fastest supercomputers, oops, I don't want you to see that yet, uh, in the world, they're all using fundamentally different architectures. Okay, so this is my energy efficiency slide, and I couldn't find an energy efficiency washer, but I found one that recycles water, yeah. and I thought it was kind of interesting. So a hardware software challenge is, is energy efficiency, the fundamentally limiting factor to building um, uh, to building uh, supercomputers, uh, exascale supercomputers. So Taihu Light has a peak power of 15 milliwatts, and that's megawatts, and that's really kind of right at the top of what people are willing to pay for. Okay, so now I'm going to get, so that's kind of setting the stage with laundry, and now I'm going to get into the technical part of the talk. So, um, so the research that we've been doing in my group for m many years is looking at uh, building programming systems using auto-tuning compiler technology. And we argue that uh, this sort of technology is really essential for getting to exascale. So um, as I said earlier, programming systems for exascale are being defined now based on that uh, uh, National Strategic Commuting Initiative. And right now in the Department of Energy, there is something called the X-Scale Computing Project, that's, uh, the goal of which is in six years to deploy the software stack for X-Scale computers. So our approach combines compiler technology, um, which generates optimized architecture-specific code from uh, a high-level specification, and also auto-tuning, which automatically searches for the best implementation of a computation from a set of things that are functionally equivalent, but they uh, have different performance properties. Okay, so auto-tuning definition. Um, uh, somebody made a joke once uh, that when I told them that I was working on auto-tuning, you know, and they, they made the joke that connecting it to uh, the auto-tuning that's found in the Urban Dictionary. Um, which probably many of you are familiar with. And so this is pitch correction software um, for vocals that make, for a lack, make up for a lack of natural singing talent. Um, and I actually just changed the words just a tiny bit to, uh, to get it to work for me. So performance correction uh, software for key computations um, makes up for the need to, to write low-level architecture-specific code, and then 90% or more High performance codes uh, use this kind of software. So auto tuning is very popular in the HPC community, but it's something that hasn't quite gotten gone mainstream. So you you might use a library that has uh, such as Atlas or um, the OSCII or something that has used auto tuning to build the library, but it's rare to build uh, applications. Um, with auto-tuning done uh, in, in the production setting. So that's really what we're trying to do with our compiler technology. So I'm gonna transition now and show you some uh, real-world examples of high-performance, architecture-specific, scientific application code from our uh, things that we've encountered in our research. Okay, so you know, look at the code on the left and the code on the right. So these are functionally equivalent. Um, which one would you rather write? And these are just sequential, the sequential core of the code. Um, and in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see that I, uh, I'll have a little motif designation. I'm gonna have a series of these kinds of codes and I'll designate the motif that they come from. So this code is, uh, code A is the uh, mini GMG uh, mini app that, uh, is a geometric, it's, it's supposed to be a proxy application for geometric multigrid. And uh, this code on the left is about 13 lines of code and embedded in it, you can see some stencil computations, um, which we're gonna come back to uh, later in the talk. The code on the right is the optimized version of this code on the left and it's about 170 lines of code. And what is, what, what's going on in this? Why, why can't you represent it with the 13 lines of code? There's a whole bunch of work to manage data movement, um, prefetching, staging data and registers and buffers, and uh, 
the SIMD and also explicitly using the SIMD intrinsics for the Intel platform. Uh, and then there's a bunch of additional optimizations for parallelization, which we're going to also um, <coughs> trading off computation for communication and uh, doing uh, various other optimizations um, to both reduce the data movement and parallelize the computation. Okay, so here's another version of the same code. This is uh, optimized for the GPU, and this is 300 lines of code, again, for that 13 that we started with. Okay, and we have other examples of this. Um, so code A in this case is a mathematical description of a tensor contraction computation. And then the uh, code B is a generated code. This is actually output of our tool, so we didn't have a uh, hand-optimized code. And so going from one line to 122 lines. And then the, the third one is a sparse matrix motif. And the code on the left is doing a um, sparse matrix multivector uh, multiply. And it's doing it on a symmetric matrix. So that's why it's a little more complicated than other versions of code you might have seen. So this is seven lines of code. And the manual optimized code from an application called Locality Optimized Block Conjugate Gradient um, is 2,000 lines of code to implement the same thing. And so what's going on there? There's matrix conversion. There's OpenMP uh, with scheduling. There's pragmas to AVX. Um, simplification of the index expressions. And then 11 different block sizes and implementations um, so different uh, implementations corresponding to different matrix representations. So these are all pieces of code that are in applications from our partner, uh, from our various partners. And, uh, and the thing is, this kind of code is not unusual. Uh, people want to get high performance. They write code that targets the architecture um, in a very specific way. And that blows the kind of low level. Um, so there are a bunch of problems with this kind of code. Uh, the first is uh, performance portability. Remember, this is how to perform well across different architectures. Um, the code for, in the one case where we had a code B and a code C, the code for the CPU and GPU were fundamentally different. And so they're not performance portable across platforms. Um, it's not very productive for programmers to write this low level code. Uh, it takes a lot of work. It's hard to get it right. You have to be pretty uh, sophisticated to know what to do. And then finally, you end up with code that you can't maintain and can't port to another architecture. So what people often do, especially in this era of CPUs and GPUs, they have two different versions of their code. Um, and they're completely fundamentally different. And then they have to kind of carry those along. So what are we going to do to get all these uh, nice desirability, productivity, maintainability? Um, what are the, and what are the kind of ideas that are floating around for exascale software? So one thing that some people would like to do is follow the, the standards for MPI and OpenMP. Um, and uh, as you may know, in OpenMP, there's a bunch of uh, extensions in OpenMP4 to support accelerators and SIMD uh, architectures like AVX. And so there is a way to ex express the kind, you know, some code that would run on different target architectures um, using OpenMP. Uh, and there are also extensions happening to MPI sort of going in the opposite direction. Um, but even if you write the same code and it runs on two different platforms, it, it probably isn't gonna perform very well. A lot of uh, uh, things are very sensitive to how you lay out the data and how you parallelize the computation and those are things that come out of the architecture. So um, there are people working on domain specific framework strategies. And so the key idea here is suppose you pick a particular application domain. I called them motifs in the uh, earlier slides. Then you can build a system that's customized to that domain. 
and you can um, you can uh, optimize it and specialize it for that domain. So there are lots of, of strategies for doing this, and, I, and I'm going to talk about one in this talk. Um, some of them involve libraries or C++ template expansion or standalone um, domain-specific languages. Um, but all of these kinds of strategies aren't really composable with op other optimizations. And so that's, you know, that's my pitch for why you need a compiler. Compilers give you composability, and they make it possible to optimize code in the context in which execute. Okay, so, so he, the, the solution to this is somehow programming systems have to hide uh, this complexity of going to different kinds of target. And so um, the idea is to define a common ab abstraction and use the compiler to map to uh, optimal hard architecture specific implementation. And so our, our compiler is this is sitting here in this cloud in the middle. It's doing uh, code generation and auto tuning in order to generate the optimized code. Okay, so our approach, um, we have a compiler which we call Chill. It's an optimization framework. It can perform domain specific specialization and its target is loop-based scientific applications such as the motifs that I showed in earlier slides. So um, it leverages a bunch of existing transformations, so therefore if you have a particular motif, you can optimize it with standard transformations, but you can also add domain-specific transformations, and you can compose them all together. Uh, the kind of compiler framework it is, I'm, I uh, am not going to talk about in great depth, but it's a polyhedral framework. And what that means is that you have a mathematical de uh, description of the loop net computations, and you apply uh, transformations as affine, um, uh, uh, affine transformations on the um, uh, iteration spaces coming out of the loop net computation. Um, there's underlying data dependence analysis to make sure uh, that your transformations are correct and safe. And then there's uh, polyhedral scanning used to, to generate the code at the end. And so what a polyhedral framework allows you to do is <clears throat> compose a bunch of different sequence and generate correct code because it's based on a mathematical representation. And so this gives you composability, and that's kind of my theme. The other thing that makes this a very unusual kind of compiler is that instead of just saying 03 and a bunch of stuff happens behind the scenes and you have no idea what the compiler did, we actually make it possible to explicitly direct the compiler with what we call transformation recipes to describe the co collection of uh, transformations that you want to apply to the code. So, um, the optimization strategy is actually exposed, and by exposing it, uh, the auto-tuner can try a bunch of different uh, optimization strategies. Um, so, so then if, we, if we're describing, so if a, a, an optimized piece of code can be described with the input code plus a transformation recipe, then we can describe a search space of different implementation um, <clears throat> by having a, a, a group of transformation recipes, each one having a bunch of parameters associated with it. So uh, that's where the auto-tuning comes in. And uh, it's a systematic exploration. We're actually generating a bunch of different implementations, and we're measuring their performance in, in uh, context with representative uh, uh, data sets, and then we're... Uh, finding the, the version that gives us the best performance. So going back to when I talked about energy efficiency, this can both be um, execution time or it could be something related to energy or power. So you could use auto-tuning to find something, uh, find an implementation that is both energy efficient and, and uh, high performance, for example. So that's kind of the key idea. So now I'm gonna walk through um, and so, so using this approach, we want to automate the process of generating code B or C from code A. And so this is just a little bit about chill. 
Um, <clears throat> so you start with source code. Uh, mostly we focus on C and C++. Um, we have uh, support for either rows as the front end or Clang as the front end. Um, and then we have a, a, an abstract syntax tree representation that is sort of uh, independent of what compiler you're part of. So this, this part is kind of standalone. Um, we use a transformation recipe to decide uh, what transformations to apply. And then we generate output code. And that output code is still source code. It could be C, it could be CUDA. It might be C with OpenMP. Um, <clears throat> and so generating source code is valuable if you want to be able to port from one architecture to another. So that's kind of why we do it. Uh, and then we can also leverage backend compilers for doing low level instruction selection, like picking the AVX instructions. And so this is, this is a, you can think of it as the kind of transformations we're applying are high level, you know, change the way that memory is accessed, change the parallelization strategy, um, these higher level optimizations, and then we're relying on a backend compiler to do the more conventional optimizations. Okay, so, so now I'm gonna walk through an example um, of one of the motifs that I described. So this is optimizing the stencils in the context of ManyGMG. And so uh, ManyGMG is a proxy application for geometric multi, uh, multigrid. Um, and the idea with geometric multigrid is you're, you're gonna reduce the amount of computation you have to do by running uh, the computation at different course, coarsenings of the grid. So um, the really expensive computation is done on the, the finest grid and otherwise you're, you're operating on coarser grids. And um, there's a sequence of operators uh, that are applied uh, during this, uh, what's called a V cycle, uh, making it finer and then making it coarser. Um, and the most computationally intensive is the smooth uh, up there at the top on the left. Um, <clears throat> in the smooth operator are stencil computations. Um, so uh, from a compiler's perspective, what uh, is important about stencil computations is you use nearby inputs to compute output, uh, an output value. And so um, this has a bunch of performance issues because a computation to produce a single output um, accesses a lot of memory. And so we'll make that a little bit more concrete as a slide as I uh, go further. So here is a, a three-dimensional seven-point constant coefficient stencil. Um, <clears throat> it it uh, is a Jacobi iteration uh, implementation. And uh, the uh, so it's, it's sweeping over uh, n-cube grids. Um, you're reading uh, seven uh, points, and that's why it's a seven-point stencil. And then uh, you're writing phi out um, in that 3D space. Uh, w1 and w2 are the constant coefficients. So one thing we can do with this code is we can analyze its arithmetic intensity. So that's the ratio of uh, floating point computations to uh, the data that you have to move um, associated with those computations. So in this computation, for each point in this 3D space, you um, do six adds and two multiplies, or eight floating point operations. Uh, you read uh, the input phi n, uh, n cubed of them. Uh, this is an Intel platform which uh, uses write allocate. When you actually write uh, the output, you, you read it into the memory system, you pull it all the way into the memory hierarchy, um, and that's called write allocate, and then you do the actual write. So now you have to push it back out of the memory hierarchy. So if we look at this loop nest computation, this is assuming that you only move data once, that it, once you load it, it remains in the memory hierarchy and you don't have to move it again. So that's very optimistic. 
<clears throat> so we have eight times n cubed floating point operations. And the data we move is three times this n cubed, and it's times eight because it's double precision, so it's eight bytes per element. Okay, so if you compute this ratio, the arithmetic intensity is 0.33, so it's less than one. So that means that we're moving um, much more data for every floating point computation. That we need to do. Okay, so now let's look at a, a, an architecture. Um, this is a supercomputer, sort of a workaday supercomputer at, at NERSC at, at uh, Berkeley Labs. And <clears throat> each node in Edison uh, is uh, two 12 core uh, Xeon Ivy Bridge, uh, Intel Xeon Ivy Bridge. And so we can compute something called the machine balance for Edison. So we, um, the floating point operations per second are, uh, that's for a node, uh, this two 12 core Ivy Bridge, that's in gigaflops. And then this DRAM memory bandwidth, you can calculate by running something called the stream triad benchmark. And that's 103 gigabytes. And so we end up with a machine balance that's 4.5. So this is, we can do 4.5 uh, floating operation, point operations and the time it takes to move a byte of data. Okay, so if we're fully utilizing Edison, we want uh, uh, computations that use 4.5 flops per byte. So if you're paying attention in the previous slide to the arithmetic intensity of stencils, you'll see that, uh, you know, here's this stencil, you'll see that uh, if peak performance is at 4.5 flops per byte, then we're off by almost a factor of 14 with this computation. So it's limited, its performance is gonna be limited by memory bandwidth. Um, the architecture just can't feed the compute units fast enough. Okay, and Here's some other stencils that are gonna appear in some of my graphs, and I don't have a bunch of time to, to uh, describe them, but uh, as, we're going, uh, as we're going from top to bottom, we are computing more, uh, using more inputs to compute an output. And it may be counterintuitive, um, but these are actually uh, more uh, compute bound as you go, uh, to this sequence of, of stencils because um, the, this large 125 point stencil at the bottom, it's, uh, it's computing, uh, it's arithmetic intensity is 5.58 because there's a lot of data that's reused across uh, the iterations of the 3D loop nest. And so as we go through this progression, we have stencils that start out um, very memory bound and make their way to compute bound on on the Edison architecture. Okay, so how does our compiler transform code A to code B? So let me give you the very high level version. Um, so uh, solution part one is we perform communication avoiding optimization. So there are two kinds of communication that you might have. Uh, I'm going to have to move my computer. Excuse me. And now you're, you won't get to see Utah, but I won't run out of battery power. Okay. So, um, the, the horizontal communication is communicating across nodes. Um, and, um, and vertical communication is, is communication through the memory hierarchy. So, Horizontal communication includes exchanging boundary values across nodes. Um, vertical communication is anytime things don't, don't stay in cache and you have to reload them. Um, so a loop nest is a grid sweep and anytime you do a new grid sweep, you may have traffic to the memory system. Okay, so the optimization strategy for horizontal um, communication avoiding is to use ghost zones, which I'll show you on, in the next slide, um, to allow multiple sweeps before you exchange data. And on the vertical side, there you want to reduce the number of grid sweeps and you fuse them uh, in a variety of ways. Okay, so ghost zones, so if you remember the stencil is looking at a bunch of input, surrounding input points to compute an output point. 
<clears throat> so the ghost zone is a region beyond the region that the uh, that is uh, needed uh, for the output variable. So it even if you don't um, do communication avoiding, you still need a go zone. But um, you can expand the go zone depth. And what can happen then is each node can do several iterations of the computation before uh, it, uh, it needs to communicate. And so this is one way in which you can reduce horizontal communication. Um, and uh, the next is a parallel wavefront. And this is actually sort of a skeleton of the generated code without a lot of details in it. Um, and so this is reduced, this allows it, this is a very standard um, uh, trick of uh, uh, allowing you to fuse multiple grid sweeps and reduce the vertical communication. And you can see the code that you have to write is fairly complicated. Um, in compiler terminology, this is a wavefront is uses skew and permute, which are very standard compiler transformations. Floating around in here is a little bit of open peak code generation. Um, solution part two is to avoid redundant computations if your code is compute bound. So um, if you look at this, uh, this 2D nine point stencil, you can see that there's a whole lot of redundant computation going on. Not only are we re loading redundant data, but some of the adds and multiplies are also redundant. And what we can do is we uh, can uh, uh, take advantage of the fact that these coefficients are symmetric uh, in, in the two dimensions. Um, and so consequently, the additions and multiplies are redundant. And so uh, we can uh, cache the, put them in a buffer and reuse them from the buffer without uh, uh, repeating them. And so this is a particular transformation called partial sum that recognizes uh, the uh, the fact that you have the symmetry and you have these redundant computations it simplifies the computation and so in this particular example for just that nine point uh, stencil we um, reduce the the number of floating point operations to five from eight so this is what you do if your stencil computation is compute bound um, to reduce the amount of computation Okay, and then um, this is the parallel, parallel decomposition. So uh, this is how a, ver a variety of strategies that we explore in our auto tuning um, to figure out how to parallelize the uh, the uh, boxes that arise from geometric multigrid. Okay, so here's the optimization uh, methodology that we used. So we write a bunch of scripts for chill that describe different uh, optimization strategies. And on the right here is a chill script that applies a couple of transformations, uh, skew, permute, tile, and um, something involving the ghost zones and uh, generates open and P code. And so we can explore a variety of these scripts and generate code. Um, and the two things are really tuning, the three things are really tuning are the ghost zone depth, how we do the threading, and then which optimizations we choose to apply. So we may not apply all of them. Okay, and so what did we learn from this work? First of all, code A sometimes actually can beat code B. Um, so code B is something manually tuned by an expert. Um, the compiler can actually generate this faster. Um, and why can a compiler generate code that's faster? It's because uh, the, um, the manual tuning, the programmer is going to give up at some point and not do things that aren't going to pay off very much, but the compiler can explore those things. And so we're seeing a little bit of payoff, particularly at the small box sizes. Um, the small box sizes, there's not a lot of computation. Uh, so the manual tuner didn't really spend a bunch of time on that. So the, anything with a light green at the top shows something our compiler can, can be faster at. Um, this is a showing partial sums, which was for compute bound, uh, compute bound stencils. Um, 
And so uh, it's only really useful for the 27 and the 100, 125 point um, stencils. Uh, that's the orange ones. And what we learned is once you use partial sums and you make the, the compute bound stencil be less compute bound, now it becomes memory bound. And then you can apply the, um, the communication avoiding optimizations to make it more closer to the machine balance. Okay, and then one more uh, slide. This is just showing that this approach is also performance portable because we can generate both CPU and GPU code. And I'm not quite sure why we have uh, manual OpenMP code here, um, but you can see we can, uh, in, in previous slides we were showing um, automatically generated OpenMP code. I think it's because we don't have the generated code for all of these different types of stencils. Um, and so over here on the right, these are these uh, orange bars are code that our compiler generated for the Titan uh, supercomputer at Oak Ridge. Okay, so that's kind of uh, getting me to the end here. Um, so I focused this talk on stencils and geometric multigrids. And this table is just showing um, how you use this approach in the context of that particular uh, motif, but we've also, I showed you examples of other motifs, uh, tensor contraction and spectral element, uh, and also sparse matrix computation. And we've actually been, you know, probably doing even more work on sparse matrix computation. We have a paper at supercomputing in a week and a half on this. And so um, we've actually shown that this approach is effective for all of these different motifs. And, um, and the impact is uh, that we can generate architecture specific optimization um, from high level specification of the application code. And this is, uh, we're, we're focused on a single node, so we can, we can optimize MPI applications, but we're not optimizing the MPI part of the application. Um, what we've shown in all these motifs is that we can come very close to manually code and sometimes we can be faster and and using this approach we can achieve performance portability productivity and maintainability um, so with that I'll, I'll take questions Thank you.